All right, what's up? So episode two, um, we have a, a a friend of mine, a fellow entrepreneur, TJ McCall. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that, of course. Uh, I, was, I was saying just before you went to start this, that marriage is looking tight. Like, oh, just for totally. men, like model, <laughs> for sure. Do you see how much, Feeling I don't know it. if you can tell, so much oh, gray bro, coming bro, in on the side. You ain't got nothing on it. Yeah. That's true. Look at those guys. Well, yeah, it's this like, is thick. <laughs> I've got the random, uh, like one or two coming in on the mustache. You know, I'm just, I'm ready to go full. Like, let's just go on full gray. I have nothing to hide. I would never even, I'd never color it. I think it's great. Um, yeah, yeah. no, nah, you, you, you'll be looking like James Bond once that thing <laughs> goes gray. Minus the muscles, the fit, the wardrobe, Dude, the women. Have you seen the latest James Bond? I mean, I have he's, he's just thin and ready to go, looking really? sharp. Okay, I have to check it out. Let it out. <laughs> so I thought we could start with I was gonna I was gonna give my perspective of how we first met, but what I think would be interesting is for you to give your perspective on how we first met. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you recall this, if not, I'm happy to give my my two cents. But I'd love to hear the first time that you ran into me, what you're doing, how that felt, and then I'll give yeah. you my perspective because I think there were two maybe two different uh, views into it. Well, yeah, I'm sure there was, but um, yeah, I've always been into woodworking and I'm literally in my driveway because I didn't want to dirty up my pretty garage with my home gym. So I'm out in my driveway, literally sanding on this massive, like 10 foot long uh, piece of live edge wood, you know, going to make a table out of it. I, I ended up taking down like, three or four trees on this ranch, this uh, old dude named Gene out in uh, Red Rock, Texas, he, he hooked me up, but I had a lot of wood. So I'm out here sanding, trying to make this table. And then this family of, I think it was maybe. So it might've been four at the time. It, it was, yeah, it was you, you, the wife, and then the two little ones, and then one on the way. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I can't remember if you were like, I think you were on a bike. I, I don't was. think you were rollerblading. <laughs> no, I was on a bike. No, no, I was on a bike. She has some respect uh, yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. But uh, yeah, no, you roll up on a bike and you said, hey, is that live edge wood? And I said, yeah. And then after that, you got off your bike, came over. We shot the mess for a minute. You know, my wife stepped out. We We instantly hit it off. Good people you know, in our neighborhood and, uh, nah, pleasure to meet you, brother. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, asking. Yeah. Well, so the interest from my end, I just want to tell, <laughs> so we were riding the, we were riding a bike. We, I remember riding past your house <laughs> and we had just moved there, uh, at the time to Austin. So we were looking to meet people, et cetera. So we're driving by, riding by whatever. And Megan looks over and I think she was checking you out, but she'll never say it. Cause your shirt was off and you just, you're a very fit gentleman and you have tattoos. And she looked at me and she said, she said, Jordan, he has tattoos just like you. Maybe you could be friends with him. And I, I feel like this is Megan's MO for a lot of things. She's always trying to find me friends. I don't think she thinks I have enough friends or I don't know. I'm kind of a lone wolf. She's like, yeah, he has well, I kind of heard that in your last one too. The uh, hockey player at the grocery store. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know Not what's going on. I'm, I'm an extrovert when I need to be, but I think I find my energy a alone a lot of times. So she's trying to push me out of my comfort zone. She's like, yeah, I should go talk to him. You know, <laughs> and at that point, it was a challenge. So I was just like, okay, I'll prove to you that I will. And I saw you were working on Live Edge. But to me, it was funny because, uh, yeah, she's always just trying to hook me up with other guys in regards to finding friends. But, yeah, so we we chatted a little bit. And then, um, you know, I was working for Facebook at the time, and I think – I don't know, it was a week, week or two thereafter. I was over at the house helping you work on some stuff on, uh, you know, with some ads on Facebook for, for McCall Fitness. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and that's when, we, <laughs> that's when we went. We got even deeper. So I won't go into all the detail, but I will tell you that if you recall, which it was, I was sitting in that same exact seat you're in right now at that table, the same that's exact right. view. So I'm you and you're me, and you're looking totally. over at me, and we're talking about ads, something on Facebook. <laughs> And we're drinking bourbon at like 10 in the morning. It was. Yes. So I have nothing in my stomach. 
bourbon. And I guess you hadn't for several days prior. I heard there was some type of fasting going on or something. Might have been. I have a tendency to just forget to eat. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so long story short, some drinks were had, some, some things were done. I end up being a hot mess, being passed out on your couch all day and uh, from, from yeah. overindulgence. Yeah. Yeah, and real quick, that was like the very first time that you were at my house. Correct, yes. I mean, we literally talked in the street once whenever I was working on wood. Then I needed some help with my Facebook mess, and uh, you slid through, and party was on at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, so see, that's, <laughs> I, I guess that's the – I just go deep. I go deep and hard really fast in regards to like finding those friendships and making sure there's a, a, a tight bond. Because, I mean, I was getting sick at your house, and <laughs> – I remember, I remember your wife was feeding me. I, I'll, I'll go into this much detail. I remember getting sick on your couch. I think it might have been a brand new couch, or it was, a, it was a very nice, like oh, white. Brand new. We, yeah. Hey, we, we, we just moved here too, so it was brand new. Okay. So I remember. But I saw I, that look on your face, so I grabbed something, little, little mini trash can. Yes. End up getting sick, passing out, and then I remember <laughs> at one point, Christy, your wife, came up to me, and she had a protein bar. And I, I've never in my life had, I've had protein bars, but this was just, it tasted like straight chalk and I couldn't even get it. I couldn't even blend it in my mouth. It was, it was awful. And it was very kind of her to try and like get something in my stomach. So yeah, that was, uh, and then I believe she called my wife, which by the way, we had just met. So this is the real time. She's first real time. She's talking to Chrissy outside of when we met at your house. And, and I think in her mind, she was like, what did you do to my husband? Like, he's been over there for a couple hours and now he's all messed up. But, um, she was calling your phone and we had to answer it. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you, you couldn't talk like, uh, yeah. Yes. So, so, so basically your wife calls my house and then a girl answers mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. my wife, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. it's like, what's really going on over there? Yeah. You know, I believe, did you drive me home? I had a new, a I new did. car at the time, that forerunner. And I, I yeah, remember you, you had that like army green. Yeah. Yeah. I remember puking on the side of that thing. You and, did uh, too. Dude, I was a hot Finch mess right. for, for, for maybe one or two days after I didn't feel normal, but I think that <laughs> all down the side. Yeah. That, that was a moment that really cemented, uh, that friendship, I believe. So much so that I feel like I can call you out of the blue having not talked to you in a little while and just have a candid conversation. So, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, it just wasn't a good idea to probably, you know, call 911 because I knew I, I that wanted you to do that, didn't I? You wanted me yeah. to, but I was like, I'm not calling 911, brother. Like, I don't need all that at my house. Like, we got this. Literally, a little bit of alcohol. Plus whatever, but nothing major. Like, yeah, there's no need. There's no need. Well, and I learned thereafter, and this kind of can be a segue into the next bit. So you you were a, a law enforcement officer in the state of California, I believe. And I remember, so I I remember you told me that after the fact, but it made more sense because when I was feeling sick and when I did pass out, I remember you taking your fist, this big manly fist. And grinding your knuckles into my sternum. And I'm like, man, this doesn't feel good at all. This really hurts. <laughs> and so tell me the technique behind that. Cause that's a, that was, you told me later, but for the audience, like, tell me what that does because I was out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's definitely a pain point, you know? <laughs> and I mean, if you get in there hard enough, it will spark some adrenaline, you know, to like kind of bring people out of whatever they're going through. But that's like, that's one of the, the first things you do um, whenever you approach someone that is unconscious, you know, or passed out from alcohol, whatever. <laughs> You'll dig in there a little bit just to see if you get a response. And if you don't, now you start trying to check vitals and things like that. But, you know, depending on the size of the person being overweight, things like that, it's like sometimes it's tough to locate that pole. So, that's your first step in saying, Hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I remember it. I, st I, I clearly remember just digging yeah. into my sternum. I'm like, man, this does not feel good. And you're just like, and you're still here. You're all right. Like this is the reality uh, check. So yeah, I was trying to, uh, talk you off that anxiety cliff. I was there. 
you, you were going there, bro. And I was like, what are we doing? Like, who is this guy? I just met him. <laughs> <laughs> right. This guy's a mess. I'm never hanging out with you him know, again. His wife's going to show up here and start shooting all of us because she thinks we have her <laughs> husband hostage for, you know, first time he ever came over here. And it's 10 in the morning. And she's really going to believe, like, he's wasted on my couch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, there it was. So talk to me. About, uh, and I, we've talked about this a little bit, but as deep and far as you want to go, you were, you know, in, in a police officer in the state of California, correct? And th- that was before you moved to Austin, Texas. Yeah, I, uh, I never knew what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, was trying to, you know, pay for college on my own. Um, didn't have, you know, I, I had my mom, but, um, she really couldn't afford it. So I was trying to put myself through college while at the same time, I was literally working three jobs to pay for my, you know, um, I wasn't living with my mom at the time. So I had my own place. I was trying to pay for that, trying to pay for this new 1995 Jeep that I bought brand new off the lot. That's how far back this is. Uh, I was like 19 at the time. So I'd pay for that. And pay for school. And um, I was really trying to focus on physical therapy just because I've always been into fitness, you mm-hmm. know, and recovery and healing your body, um, whether that is through actual, you know, fitness training or supplementation, things like that. So, um, you know, trying to march my way through school and then. The sheriff's department where I was at in Kern County, because I grew up in Bakersfield, California, um, the sheriff's department, they had basically some type of freeze on their hiring for like 10 years. It was crazy. Like they didn't do any hiring. And they lifted this uh, freeze and it was a big deal throughout my area, you know, because because you get hired on, you know, as a sheriff or, you know, in law enforcement, you know, it's good pay. There's a retirement. There's amazing health benefits. Absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just rolled the dice. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and apply for law enforcement. I mean, prior to that, I was the dude running down the alley trying to get away (laughs) or whatever. You know, we're at a dirt party. The lights come in. We're taking off, driving way faster than we should to get away. But just things like that. but yeah, I, I I chose just to roll the dice and just get into law enforcement. Usually law enforcement, you know, there's a dad or a grandfather or somebody mm-hmm. within the family, you know, that kind of sets that path. And um, I didn't have that. I just knew that I couldn't keep working three jobs and paying for college and trying to like do something to get a degree. Sure. I was just worn thin. I was literally going to bed after my last my last job, I was getting to bed about 11 and then having to wake up like at four in the morning to hit the next one and then schedule my classes in between my job in the middle. So it was, it was absolutely nuts. And I was just 19 at the time, like I say, running myself completely thin. And the, like I say, you had to be, I think it was 18 at the time. You were actually applying to be a sheriff. And you had to be 21 by the completion of the academy. So, you know, I mean, you get in, you take a written test, you you know, from there, they'll move you on to the next phase, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, pass a written, then you get like an oral interview. Then if you move on from that, now it's like a physical agility, different physical agility, your place according to your score on a list. And then from there, now they start hitting the academies and the list is good for like three years. So I knew if I passed everything at the age of 19, you know, you had to be 21 to get hired. So you could actually enter a bar to do bar checks, things like that. Um, I knew that, you know, by the time I finally got hired on, I was going to be of age. So, sure. yeah, I got in there and um, went through the academy passed everything, got hired on, you know, and I got hired on basically like a month before my 21st birthday. 
And um, so you made it. You made it in time. I did. I did. And, and, and I was originally with the Kern County Sheriff's Department um, working out of Bakersfield. And then from there um, in 2007, so I started in 96 with the Sheriff's Department. Um, left the Sheriff's Department in 2007 and transferred to Paso Robles Police Department, um, which was closer to the beach. I was single at the time, no kids, mm-hmm. and just wanted to like get close to the beach, like a cool place to live, and tested for Paso, passed everything, the interviews. They took me in as a lateral, um, which means you're experienced. Okay. And they gave me, you know, basically – top pay for you know my experience and from there i was at the beach and then that uh yeah and i probably went further into that than what you were asking no you're but fine yeah, so yeah were, went, were you a beach, were you a beach cop at one beach. point what's that were you a beach cop at one point or were you working the city no how does that work Paso, i was working in past robles which is complete wine country okay. and then um i was living i because i was living in paso but i think the population at the time was like twenty five thousand. So. Literally, I'd be like pumping gas, and then all of a sudden, I'd see someone that I arrested, and they'd be like, <laughs> "Hey, I know you," and I'm like, mm, "This isn't a good deal." <laughs> so, because in Bakersfield, I mean, that's a small town filled with a high population, mm-hmm. you know. So, if I was working East Bakersfield, I was living over here. You know, you never see these people. Sure, but in Paso, like I say, population was maybe 25k, and so you're public gas, you see someone and then it's like, dang it. Did that bother, so I, does that bother yeah. you in, in regards to maybe, or make you feel uncomfortable running into people well, that maybe. No, you... I mean, as long as you're treating people fair, mm-hmm. you know? And then it was like, honestly, the level of crime between, you know, Bakersfield and Paso is night and day. Like Bakersfield is off the chain, you know? I mean, as far as per capita, the crime rate is through the roof in Bakersfield. I mean, sometimes it was bouncing in between number one and number two was like having the highest crime rate in the state of California. No kidding. I mean, we all see what's happening in California, you know, but um, yeah, it, it was, it's definitely wild West, you know, but then I go to Paso and it's like, it's, it, it's, it, they, you know, they wanted more like traffic enforcement because there wasn't a whole lot going on. Sure. So what what was the difference then between, I was going to ask between the two, the two places, the two cities was one more, okay. Traffic stops, speeding tickets and the other ones more crime. Was there a big distinction there between the work between the two? Yeah. And I mean, there was, there there, there was crime in both areas, but I mean, the, the the crime level as far as like like intensity of it, mm-hmm. you know, homicides, major drugs, you know, spousal abuses, like Bakersfield was very, very much higher than than Paso. Paso was like it seemed like it was a lot of theft, you know, and people around there, there was there's not a whole lot to get into. So there was a lot of people living on, you know. Do, do, doing drugs sure um but yeah i mean drugs are everywhere but i mean as far as like paso goes minimal compared to bakersfield okay the good thing about you know my time in bakersfield was um working for the sheriff's department kind of get to like do your own thing you know i mean a lot of times you're as busy as you want because you have a ticket book, but you don't have to enforce traffic. There's no no quotas or anything? No. And I mean, <laughs> there's supposed to be no quotas. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you what, at the end of the month in Paso, don't be the dude yeah. that has the least amount of tickets for the third month in row. Well, I know as and a I civilian mean, end of month, like I know when I'm driving around up on the interstate and it's end of month, I don't care where I'm at. I am... This maybe five over the speed limit. I don't want to give anybody an excuse to write me up. I, I fully agree. I mean, you know, everybody's, you know, timelines are different as far as yeah. the quotas. And oh, and I'm probably not even right. Starting. I'm making assumptions of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good for you. Fun fact, yeah, we got you- pulled over three weeks ago uh, on the way to church. 
So we would, <laughs> Megan has still been rolling. And I say Megan, but I, it's just because I didn't do anything about it yet. But our black Suburban, we still had the Texas tags on it. And they were, number one, because taxes are cheaper there, right? So the, the car of registration course. in the state of Kentucky is absurd. It's maybe seven or $800. I don't know. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But when we were there, we lived in Texas for seven years. It was maybe 70, 80 bucks a year. So I was riding that out of state registration yeah, man, for sure. <laughs> and then it, it got to the point where, and I'd done that for maybe a year, registered an out of state vehicle. Um, I don't know if I should or shouldn't say that. It doesn't matter. But Megan's car, her registration was expired. And I got the notion here in Kentucky that maybe they would not pull you over if you were out of state because they wouldn't have the ha- they wouldn't want to deal with it or want, wouldn't want to hassle with you being out of state. I don't know. That was just the notion in my mind. So we've been riding around since October of last year with expired tags. So I get lit up on the way to church and the guy's super nice. He's more of a, you know, we we're kind of in the country going to church over in a place called Independence, Kentucky, but pulls us over. Kids are in the back seat, so they're all, you know, Sunday dress for school, and Ari is crying. They all, they're out, they all think I'm going to jail, uh, which clearly they just have no idea. So, hey, sir, do you know what I pulled you over for? I'm like, look, I have no idea. It's like, I know I wasn't speeding. And as I'm saying that, I looked up at the registration in the front window, and I saw t- 1023, and I'm like, mm, maybe this is it. He's like, yeah, your, your registration's expired. I said, sir, this isn't even my car. <laughs> I point over at Megan. I'm like, this is her car. I was like, let me show you my state of Kentucky license, my state of Kentucky registration. I said, my car is good to go. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I take. You you (laughs) threw her right under the bus. Hundred percent. Just to try and just to try and ease ease it up a little bit. In reality, I take care of all that anyway. (laughs) I was just (laughs) I was just being lazy. So he comes back. He's super nice. He's like, hey man, just get it taken care of. I just told him, hey, I really appreciate it. You know, I'll, and I, I literally, I took care of it the next day and got it squared away, which that's, it would have taken two hours of my time at, at any given time to do that. I was just being lazy, but, um, I don't know where I was going with that story other than my current run in with law enforcement. But yeah, it was, I think uh, you just said you got pulled over. Yeah. I mean, and then, I mean, a good cop would have probably about 20 stickers on them to give the kids little sticker badges. Oh yeah. To keep them cool. Uh, he was, he was yeah. good. No, nah, dude. <laughs> I man, I hate writing traffic tickets. You know, especially back then. I, I was, I'm 49 now, but back then, man, I, I was probably driving a little bit more than the speed limit, and mm-hmm. not wearing my seatbelt that often, and just doing <laughs> stupid stuff. But I mean, I can't be a hypocrite, you know. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. Work for the sheriff's department, you could do your own stuff, like. If I had the right crew on, because mm-hmm. I always chose to work graveyards, you know, and I would work Friday, Saturday nights just because I want to go by quick. And then throughout the week, because we would do sometimes uh, we do 10 hour shifts, sometimes 12 hour shifts. So you'd get, you know, you know, four days on and three days off. And then that's your, you know, for a 10 hour shift, that's your 40 mm-hmm. hours for the week. So you get three days off in a row at a time. So. I just, I would always try to take those days off to handle business, but, you know, I wanted to be in the thick of things um, and work those Friday, Saturday nights. But we would, if I had the right crew, we would just go in and pull up a bunch of felony warrants. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. what's better than that? Like these, the, the, these are felonies. So you're not just driving around, just like trying to find something, sure. you know? And I started doing that. Cause after I left Bakersfield, I still had the sheriff in me. So then I go to Paso and Paso Robles and, and, um, I'm there. And for the first couple of years, I was getting awards for having the most felony arrests <laughs> because that's what I would do. I would go pull up felony warrants to see who's like on the run and, you know, do it that way mm-hmm. and, and get, I guess quotas or accolades or, you know, whatever, showing I'm busy doing things, go get these guys that have already broken the law, Mm -hmm. you know, and if it comes my way, of course I'll divert, you know, if we have something, you know, hot happening now. You're like, no, 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 not right now. That, that bank robbery can wait. I'm on, I'm working the beat here on this, this felony case. But yeah, I, I, I would do that. And, you know, 
I hate saying this. I mean, the sergeant's gone now. But the thing about it was, in Paso, because it was a smaller town, if you made an arrest, I'd have to drive him 30 minutes south to San Luis Obispo Jail to house our felonies. If it was a misdemeanor, we could house him in Paso, but felonies, mm. we had to drive him south. So I was taking a lot of trips down to San, Lu- San yeah. Luis Obispo. You did it to yourself. One of my sergeants, one of my <laughs> sergeants was like, hey, man, you're making too many felony arrests. Like, you got to stop. Like, <laughs> we need you here in this city, you know? Yeah. Um, keeping the streets safe. And I was like, I feel like, you know, I feel like if I'm taking a felony suspect off the street, like, that's good. Like, that's keeping the streets safe. But anyways. You're racking up all the mileage on the, there. you're racking up the mileage on the cruiser, man. You just, the wear and tear on the tires from driving back and forth. You just got to take it easy. Hey, hey maybe that, maybe <laughs> that's what it was too. The, uh, the, the, the mayor was like, we're not trying to spend all this money on his vehicles. <laughs> what, uh, what's, so in your time in law enforcement, and we can go as crazy you want to get, or just as mild, but what, what's one of the, I'm sure there are many of them. One of the craziest things. It doesn't even have to be like the most violent, but crazy. You don't want to go there. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, don't, we don't have to. I saw a look on your face. Oh, that- no, no, no. I mean, there was, there's multiple crazy things. I mean, gunpoint and pulling guns and, I guess I kind of have two. I have two, but um, one of them was a uh, a motorcycle accident. Those are tough, man. Mm-hmm. Those are tough. Motorcycle accident. And it was uh, two guys. I guess they might have been running a little bit late to work. Two guys on a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Co-workers. Flying. And... Uh, can you see me, brother? Yeah, I got you. You're okay here. All right. It said something about refresh. I still got you on this end. All right. I just want to talk to this. You want to talk to a black screen? <laughs> nah, I'm good. This is weird. Have any of your uh, other folks had this issue? Mm-mm. You're the first, TJ. Well, um, I am not going to be able to see for a minute because it's trying to get me to uh, download Chrome all over again. I don't know what that's about. Okay. But um, yeah, no, it was a uh, it was a motorcycle wreck, and these guys were flying to work, and they hit the side of a U-Haul. And uh, this U-Haul was pulling out of a driveway, um, you know, and it was early in the morning. So it was like 730 and that sun was creeping up. And I guess it was possibly Mm -hmm. in the eyes of the uh, driver of the U-Haul. And he pulled out into traffic and didn't see that motorcycle. And it was one of the most uh, horrific uh, accidents I've been a part of. The, The dude that was... Operating the bike, he passed on scene, and the other guy was on his last couple breaths. Um, but yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was definitely something that sticks with me. Um, I think about it often. Um, That's tough. Yeah, dude, it, it, it is. It is because I mean that was that was kind of early on too. But as far as because I mean I saw I've seen a, quite a few dead bodies Mm -hmm. but just that accident the impact and dude it just like shattered the guy's helmet and it was it was it was it it almost looked fake like you know how how could this possibly happen yeah and i wasn't even dispatched to i was literally right there like when it happened so i was like the first um i was like right down the street from it and uh you know, I could see this smoke debris in the street. And then I see, you know, a couple guys, you know, people start running out to the street and, you know, two guys pick up the motorcycle and kind of will mm-hmm. to the curb. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, there's, I see on you know, TikTok and Instagram a lot, there's all these 
especially with helmet cams now with with motorcyclists they're filming themselves on the street or on the interstate speeding or doing something and more often than not i see videos of potentially they're running from the cops or they're you know oh, yeah because they can because probably you know they're 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 faster more agile they can they can get away but I, in these other videos you see motorcyclists getting pulled over and you know i just yeah there's a speeding aspect of it but i can't i don't know i can't imagine as a police officer you know number one pulling you over for speeding but just trying to keep you safe too right because if i'm young if i'm 18 19 or whatever and i think i'm you know i wanted a motorcycle at one point my parents always said no i still want a motorcycle megan said no so i'm not getting a motorcycle <laughs> but you ju those things especially that story you just recalled it's like you probably can't unsee that the first responders on the scene for those things they can't unsee how horrific they are and I'm not saying that if you were in a car the same thing wouldn't happen right but uh you're not protected obviously as well as being in a car as you are on a motorcycle so i just have the utmost empathy for you know officers in this situation that are pulling over bikers for speeding it's like yeah i pulled you over for speeding but a lot of the videos i see are just like man i just want you to be safe i've seen so much stuff here on the streets and so many of these accidents and i see this day in and day out that i don't want this to happen to you so it's a uh, it's very very interesting. Thanks thanks for um thanks for sharing. I know that's probably not, you know, great to recall. Yeah, no, I, I like I say, it's it's something that stuck with me. I, I think about it often, but yeah, it's just uh and, and that's the thing about it too, you know. There, there there's there, there's people out there that pump fear into the younger generation to be afraid of cops. And Unfortunately, sometimes accidents happen because they decide to run from the cops. And I said earlier, like, I did the same thing, man. You're young and dumb and you're just, you're, you're running from a dirt party or whatever I had said earlier. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like out in a dirt field, you know, right. whenever you're actually in the city limits and you're like, you know, you have no regard for those around you it puts a lot of people at risk, including, mm -hmm. you know, the suspect or the person themselves. But it's like, I'm telling you 99.9% .9 of the time, um, cops that stop people, they truly want to handle it at the lowest level possible because if they don't, now they're stuck with this big report, you know, which sucks. No one wants to like, do that type of work. I mean, sitting there writing reports, you know, especially when it's like something major. So me as a cop, I'd always try to come in and de-escalate the situation so I could handle it at the lowest level possible. So I didn't get stuck having to drive them to jail or whatever. So it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, or get stuck with a massive report or have to go into court on your day off after working graveyard all night, you know, your sleep patterns off, things like that. So I always really, and I'm telling you, 99% of the cops out there, they want to handle it, handle it the lowest level possible. They don't want to escalate the situation to cause more paperwork, et cetera. Sure. So it's unfortunate that people try to instill fear in the younger generation, which then causes them to run from the cops and do crazy things and put a lot of extra people at risk. Yeah, it exacerbates the issue for sure. I mean, you're, you're more yeah. likely to see something online that's negative and of course that goes viral or, you know, I've seen a bit more now with, with, you know, the good guys, which you're saying like the 99% of people who are doing the right thing. I'm starting to see more of that. Cause it's like anything, it's not just being a police officer. It's like people can be people in general. Don't put a label on it. Just people, humans, you can be shitty or you can try and be good. And I have the, I'd like to believe that most people try to be good or do the right thing, but you're always going to have this, some people who are shitty, whether that's being a police officer, whether that's just being, you know, an individual human being. So yeah, I, yeah. a bad rap. And I think the, a lot of that's been exacerbated in the media within the last couple of years. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so unfortunate because I mean, whatever you start actually putting numbers on it, I mean, I'm not going to try to get into all the math, but if you look at, how many police officers there are in the United States. And I want to just 
because I researched it a while back and it's been a minute, but I want to say, just say there's 650,000 police officers. And I know whenever I was working, you know, on average, I was getting anywhere from maybe five to seven calls a day Mm -hmm. that wasn't even self-initiated. So if you take, you know, the 650,000 officers and times that by, like I say, five or seven different contacts they have on their shift. I mean, it brings it up into the millions. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's millions of contact between police officers and just everyday citizen, you know, and then what, maybe two, three, maybe four times a year, all of a sudden the media, they take this one story and they just run with it and they just, Feed it on the news 24 seven, you know, to try to like get a response and turn people against the cops. But it's like, when you look at the grand scheme of the number of contacts that police officers have annually as a whole, like it is an enormous amount. Mm-hmm. So I mean, to have four or five incidents, which some of them should never happen whatsoever. And unfortunately it does happen. But then we get to see the officers two colors and then, you know, now, now, now they're sitting in the hot chair, you know, getting ready to, uh, you know, get sentenced for whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But then there are times where the suspect is armed or, you know, there I've seen it's where they football and they flee the vehicle and then somehow they make it back to the vehicle because there's a weapon under the seat. You know, and they're trying to reach in for this gun and then they get dealt with and they get shot. And, you know, now it's like, no, he was trying to re-enter the vehicle to gain a weapon to basically turn it against the cops that were there. Like, this isn't a good guy. Mm -hmm. But the media, they will make it out to be, you know, I mean, it could be as dumb as them saying he was reaching under the car to like, Try to grab his license. I mean, I don't know how many people keep their license underneath the front seat of the car. Like, sure. we can Monday morning quarterback it all day, but the bottom line is there are a ton of contacts between cops and everyday citizens that go perfect. Mm-hmm. And it's because the citizens, you know, they may not be happy that they get stopped by the cops, but they don't escalate the situation, you know? And sure. Yeah, that, that, that's just, you know, I'll come off that soapbox, but no, you're it's good. just, it, it, it's crazy to see what the media does with particular stories whenever there's millions of contacts daily with people and everything is fine. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to turn us a little bit here. I, I want to get into, you know, McCall Fitness a little bit more, but I think the transition into that. You had shared with me one time about, you know, how you were kind of in a bad accident and this was kind of a, I don't want to say a turning point, but maybe a moment or a story that leads into a bit of your fitness journey in the company and, and brand that you've started. I was curious if you'd mind sharing a bit of that in regards to maybe that, maybe that moment, you know, with well, however deep you want to go there. But then I'd love to start talking, you know, into the mall call fitness stuff. So I know we've been on some heavy, heavy subjects here, but I'm really excited about what you're doing in the, in the fitness space and the core bench, et cetera. So if you want to lead us into that and we can gain some traction there, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've always been into the fitness industry and like I was saying earlier, you know, one of my three jobs when I was going to college, I was a trainer for 24 hour fitness, um, at the time, at the time it was called family fitness way back in the day. Um, but yeah, I was a trainer there and then I ended up getting hired on with the sheriff's department and, um, they started kind of researching my past as, as far as you're good. One of my good ones, <laughs> you're but good. I'm, I'm not going to get it. It was a, it sounded like a little kid knocking yeah, it's, uh... all, the kids, all the kids in the neighborhood. They come over here cause they know I'll buy pictures off of them. There you go. It's either that they or draw these pictures and then they bring them. You know, Mr. TJ, and then I'm like, are they here. pictures of you, or are they just pictures of no, just random just pictures? pictures? Like a, a, one one of the kids drew a picture of a uh, old boom box from back in the day, a little ghetto blaster. Yeah, that's cool. You buy? Uh, it? I was on it. I was like, I want that one right there. 
So they so come they, over then with a portfolio of pictures, or is it just one picture you get to choose? Hey, you know what? I don't. I don't want to do this to your show, but I'm going to just get this real Dude, quick. Do it. And say yeah, it, you're fine. Not quitting. Go for it. Maybe it's a pest control, lawn care. We have pest control, lawn care. Ah, uh, you know what's up. ADP. No. Which he, one was he it? He had a soft knock. He, he had a very soft knock. I thought it was one of the little ones. That's but, how they uh, get yeah, you. He's, he's trying to paint my house, and you know we live in the same neighborhood. <laughs> what we, we we just built these things. Um. But yeah, no, everybody's trying to make a dollar. They got a few. He just he uses that. He pulls out a sheet of paper. Well, I've done your neighbors, all of your neighbors I've done recently. And you're like, nah, eh, but oh, have yeah. you? Because I'm looking at them and they're not painted. Nah, no, <laughs> I was one of the first ones here. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, man, I I show them respect. They they, they gotta they gotta provide for their families and sex. But yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, and I think uh, I was getting ready to say the sheriff's department. They found out I was working for the basically working as a personal trainer for 24 hour fitness. So they actually ended up sending me to Northern California and I got certified by U S Olympic gymnast coaches at the time. And I got, I got my certification to teach the academies and I became one of the uh, head PT instructors for the academies for all the new recruits that were hired. And it started there. Um, and once I, and that was for the sheriff's department, and then I transferred sheriff's department to Paso PD. And while I was there, um, I did some undercover assignments and we, we became shorthanded and I ended up um, getting pulled off my assignment, put back into a patrol car and we were cleaning up Highway 101 right there through Paso Robles. There was a traffic accident and the California Highway Patrol, they were on scene and they were also shorthanded, so they needed assistance. So um, I ended up setting up and I was diverting traffic at the front of the accident. Um, and it was probably about 1 30, 2 o'clock in the morning on like, I think it was like a Friday or Saturday night. Mm -hmm. So I knew the potential for drunk drivers and, and uh, I was diverting traffic and, you know, just when we were getting ready to clear, I just got seated back in my patrol car and my partner came up and he was standing and I, and the way it was, there's two lanes of traffic coming through past rolls and I had my patrol car parked sideways with the strobes going so people could see and slow down. And mm -hmm. then I could just like convert them to the off ramp. Um, you know, my partner, he, you know, they, they, they had released him from his, duty there and he came up to me and we were talking about grabbing coffee and I'm sitting in my patrol car um strobe still going parked blocking the lanes of traffic and he looks over the top of my car and he says you're gonna get hit and he takes off running towards the middle island and this car comes flying up going 70 and t-bones the crap out of my patrol car oh man and it, the, the thing about it is um you know, I'm just sitting there because I'm in park and, and he pointed it out and I'm looking over and this car is just headlights just flying towards me. And it's not slowing down. No skid. Like there was no skid at impact because, you know, as soon as the highway patrol uh, cleaned up that accident, they had to come clean up mine. So luckily we had everybody on scene. But um, you mean luckily you're as, still alive. I think that's what you meant to say. Not luckily. I think that's. Huh? That's well, crazy. They're, yeah, they're, From a standstill yeah. getting hit at 70 T bone. Yeah. Yeah. There's that too. Um, yeah. I think that's <laughs> the big, <laughs> let's not talk about the cleanup. Let's talk about you having a, yeah. a, a life. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I'm telling you literally, I just put my seatbelt on too, because they hit me so hard because it was cold. It was December when I got hit. So I just rolled my window down and I was talking to my partner because if the window was up, I guarantee I would have went through it because of the recoil. Mm -hmm. It hit me on the passenger side. And I mean, one of my last 
kind of visions was, you know, my body being slung towards impact and like basically the grill headlight of this car being buried all the way halfway into like the passenger seat. So, I mean, you know, when I'm stretched out on this, this recoil, like my head was really close to hitting the front end of their car. And, you know, from there it slung me this way. And like I say, my driver's side window was down so I could talk to my partner. Otherwise I would have like went through that and shattered that. But I ended up catching my head on the door frame of the car, which I think it pretty much knocked me out. Um, Cause whenever I came to, you know, that car, the impact of it knocked all the dust loose in all the vents because you know the, the vehicle was several years old mm-hmm. and accumulated dust but the way it was and the door panel breaking and everything um it was almost like the car it was smoke and the car was on fire well i couldn't get out of the car like they even had to like bring the jaws of life to come cut me out of the car were you um, conscious I, at this point was that did you did you pass out and where where you did you become conscious when you were still in the car and they're trying to cut you out? Oh yeah 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 like it was instant like I got knocked out for just a second okay. because by the time I came to you know there was all this this dust particle which I thought was smoke and then my partner who I was talking to that like ran to the middle island I see him and he's using my car as cover and he's like drawn with his gun laying across the hood of my car because he thought like someone purposely tried to like take a cop out, like, because there was no skid, no brakes, no swerve, no nothing, just like full on ran. And every time I watched the movie hangover, (laughs) there's that scene where they're like in the, the dad's car they they borrow. Right. And they're talking about how like the car is not in that bad a shape. And then all of a sudden, like from the passenger side, the way they, they have the camera, all you see is headlights coming towards the car and it's not slowing down. And that's whenever that black SUV T bones the crap out of that Mercedes. Yeah. Anyways, every time I see that, it's exactly, exactly what I remember. Does that do moments like that in movies when there's car crashes like that? Does that bother you at all? Are you no, no you, that's, that's, that's the only one. I mean, cause it, it, it's hard to describe like when you're just sitting there waiting. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting there waiting to be hit by a car that's like jamming, and I mean, it's that's a that, that that's a lot of weight. That's a vehicle, like right? I'm yeah. Missing. I mean, I would say there's probably, and I I say this with kindness and love. Uh, I'm not sure how you survive that, right? Like, I don't imagine. It doesn't sound like if you were to put that scenario in front of me and say, "Does that person in that car survive from a standstill with a car hitting you 70 miles an hour?" I say, not a chance. Or or walk away with like some 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 serious things, well, which yeah, might have I mean, happened, man. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I I still feel it today as far as you know the the uh, injuries, but yeah, you know, I was definitely um, <clears throat> lucky to not um, not die. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I wonder how you're. Yeah. I wonder, and not that, not not to take away from you, I would also imagine your partner probably lives with that thing in their mind too. I can't imagine, right? Looking at your friend, your partner, and just, just thinking like, oh shit, there's this car coming. Uh, I got, I'm going to run out of the way real quick. But like there's in that moment, what can you do? Right? So you can't, oh, he, he, I don't know. I just imagine that probably stays with him too on, on a different level, not as probably severe, but bizarre. Yeah. No, you, you, you just got to sit there and, watch it happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. And I mean, he, I mean, he did everything right as far as like, just, you know, figuring the fact that someone was trying to do some nasty stuff to a cop. So I had him sprawled out across my hood and then, you know, <clears throat> everybody got out of the car on that side. The driver was unlicensed. Um, they were called like the last minute to drive the owner of the car who was drunk, um, which, you know, they were looking for a ride and they were desperate and they found someone, but they were unlicensed. And I mean, there had to be 
someone was on their phone or there was communication between the driver and the passenger. Cause I mean, two o'clock in the morning, strobes completely going. You're, uh, you're going to see it. Like, yeah. So I, I don't know. That's, that, that, I guess that was why my partner originally thought they were trying to do harm. So then from this, right. Was, was there any injury done as we, you know, as you think about, like, I'm, I definitely en- enjoy this conversation. I want to get to the fitness bit, but you had some injuries from that, right? Yeah. Which actually, you know, kind of pushed me in to, you know, and I, I, that was all the lead up to, I guess your main question, but um, well, I wanted yeah. that detail. I'm not trying to dismiss any, any of it. Oh, that. yeah. No, I just, I'm, I'm going off and talking. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely a lead up because that completely shifted gears for me. Because I mean, being involved in fitness my whole life, I had to completely revamp the way I trained. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything had to be more controlled. Um, couldn't do so much like actual like free weight squats and deadlifts and a lot of the things that I used to enjoy doing and getting, you know, healthy results from. So I had to completely change the way I work out. Um, I did two years of physical therapy. Um, Hmm. the, the, the discs in my low back shifted and I don't know if I end up, you know, jacking something. I, and I had to be whenever I hit the door frame, but it almost like, kind of tore my trap muscle. Um, and then from there, it's like, it's weird because all nerves, like I still have sciatic nerve issues. Um, sometimes, you know, if I do something wrong, I will completely throw my back out to where I literally have to crawl to just get on the couch and, you know, being stubborn, whenever this first started happening, um, sometimes it would take me, longer than a week to somewhat recover. Mm. Now I kind of like the minute I feel something happen, I just, my whole day's done. I just put it on hold. Um, I do ice and ibuprofen and just stay consistent ice. But yeah, those injuries <clears throat> caused me to do two years of physical therapy and where I did my physical therapy, <clears throat> I don't want to say it was a joke. The staff was awesome but the facility was super small and they had like one bike, one treadmill mm-hmm. and then one flat bench that didn't really do anything. And we're like tying resistance bands off to like doorknobs and other things just to like do the therapy. And, uh, so after doing two years of that, um, or knowing that I was going to do in probably two years of that, I got in and started developing the core bench. Um, and early stages was basically one bench that could transform into flat incline, decline and military position. Um, and also install welded hooks all around the base of the bench. Uh, so you can hook in resistance bands and have a place to hook them to do all the therapy. Mm -hmm. And I ended up building a prototype, within a short period of time and used the very first prototype core bench to get in and, um, you know, do a lot of just my therapy whenever I was away from my, the, the facility and, uh, <clears throat> trained on that and actually had some, I, it definitely shortened my time of recovery while at the same time, You know, my medical doctors, they were pushing a lot of prescription drugs on me and, you know, working as a cop, I worked around a lot of guys that were in the military that became addicted to painkillers, Right. you know, and I could see in their face, you know, like they were struggling, even as a cop, they were struggling. And, uh, so it's it's nasty stuff. I will say just a comment on that. So, you know. You know, I think one of my one of my incidents was when I lived there in Austin with my ankle when I blew that out. Oh yeah, brother, I remember. Oof. But the way they um, and I say they, I understand the you know the need for prescription medicine. I think to your point, the how easily you can get hooked to that stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had three hip surgeries, two knee surgeries, the ankle, and I remember early on when I when I went through my first surgery, 
I don't know if they gave me Oxycontin or Percocet, what it was. But I, I will be honest with you and very transparent. Like, it felt good. It, it made me feel, it made me care less, right? So it's obviously something where there's some dis- disassociation with the pain you're feeling. It made me feel good and just made me feel relaxed. And my sister's a, a pharmacist. And I remember her coming over to the house one time and, you know, like the older sister would, she's kind of looking at, you know, what, what, the, what the doctor gave me or whatever. And I remember her counting uh, the pills and she's like, Hey, you know, you, you're not, you're not taking these like you should be. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And, and she's like, we don't have enough left here to cover you through the rest of the month. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, well, because I had to start taking two because one wasn't, one wasn't doing it anymore. And that's the yeah. moment she, she just said, Jordan, She's like, and this is how people get addicted. And it never occurred to me because I've never, I've never been into that. I've never, I've never considered pills as a way to like get high or anything. Right. But it's in that moment when I realized, oh my gosh, this is, this is most likely a one scenario of how people become addicted to these things because it's like, okay, one, one doesn't do it enough anymore. Now here's two, two doesn't do it enough anymore. Now here's whatever. So all from that point on, it was my second hip surgery. I believe it was. I stopped taking after all my, all, all my other surgeries. I just took extra strength Tylenol. I didn't take any more. And not that I didn't want to, or not that it didn't make me feel good, but the idea that something like that could just take hold. So I just, I call a story to mind because yeah, I, I felt it personally. And it's just one of those things where you got to kind of catch yourself. And if you do, you got to snap out of it quick, or I feel like it'll drag you in. Well, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> Hey, brother. I mean, you know me. We we, we like our bourbon, right. <laughs> so so I mean, you know. And I mean, I don't want to. I guess I could have been abusing it. Yeah, I was. I was down to take too quick, and you know, have a little bit of bourbon. But it was just like, besides the fact of dealing with the pain itself, mm-hmm. which was something I never experienced. Especially, I want to say I was like. 35 at the time of my accident. Yeah, I, I don't know, like 35-ish. But dude, you still consider yourself a young man? I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I, I might be done. Like, I love training. I love working out. I love doing this and that. You know, so now, not just the, the physical pain of it, but now there's that mental thing to it. Mm-hmm. And... You know, you get these pills and they feel nice and you wash down a little bit of bourbon and, you know, you're stuck at your house all day on workman's comp trying to figure your life out. And it just, you can go down the wrong hole quick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And I mean, being a cop and like I say, working with some of these dudes that were in military, some of my brothers, like they told me the horror stories Mm -hmm. and it was like, now I'm kind of like in their shoes and what, like, I'm happy I had those conversations with them because it was, it did. It it kind of inspired me to like try to do it naturally. So, you know, besides doing the um, equipment, um, I also got in and started looking like at different amino acids to kind of go in and help my body recover that way too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, came up with a really decent formula and like it was helping like, you know, dilate my circulatory system through using like, uh, arginine, um, those type of amino acids will go and open up your, you, it'll dilate your circulatory system for better blood flow. So all these good supplements you're putting in your body, they can then be distributed throughout the body and even deeper into the mus- muscle tissues because of the blood vessels, everything else being dilated. Um, you know, and, and our bodies recover a lot too, just from having high levels of oxygenated blood going through. Mm -hmm. So it was working for me. Um, the core bench was working for me and it was crazy too, because one of my doctors, he was kind of surprised by, I don't want to say how quick I was recovering, but what I was able to do in a short period of time because of the recovery that I was having. And he was actually going in for a hip surgery and he asked me to like make him a full on batch 
of what I was taking. Yeah. And I mean, those old Tupperware, like cereal boxes. Oh yeah. Like the, the Tupperware. The, the top comes off I, the really narrow ones. Yeah, that, dude. Mm -hmm. I ended up making like three of those for him because everything had to be measured out a certain way. I couldn't just like, you know, say, Hey, take this, this, and this, because I've researched the milligram count for how it should be taken, you know, and you take it you know, morning and night and, uh, he ended up taking it and he was, he, he was an old cat. I think he was creeping up on 70 and had this hip surgery and even his doctors, they were like, they, they, they were surprised by his recovery time. And he's like, I think you have something here. You know, we all have those ideas of like starting a business or doing whatever. And having the unknown of whether or not I was ever going to get back into being a cop, I had to put this on the back burner and figure out if it's a road that I wanted to go down, not knowing how to do a business. Like I say, high school, three jobs, a little bit of college. Like I had no experience in running a business. And honestly, whenever I was a cop, I would take calls from um, business owners. Maybe they were robbed, you know, whatever issues they were having. And I remember I would go talk to them and I was like, I never want to run a business. It just seems too busy, man. I'm good with like an eight to five, leave the job there. Well, being a business owner, that doesn't happen anymore. You take it to bed, you wake up with it. Sometimes you're staring at the ceiling and thinking about it. But anyways, back to what I'm saying, I finally decided, okay, I'll do something with this. And with the core bench, because, you know, to get it protected properly, you have to go through the patent process. Mm -hmm. Patent process take can, you for a uh, utility patent, that design patent for utility patent. That's the main one usually takes about four to five years for one patent to be approved. So I just go in there like a gunslinger and I'm like, here's my idea. Um, you know, I, I had the blueprints and everything set up and they started the first patent, you know, and with that length of time, four to five years for approval, I started trying to figure out ways to where I could make the core bench the most it could be because I didn't want another company coming in and making a few changes and then being able to basically steal my idea. Sure. So now, TJ, real quick, describe for people who might listen to this, and I've seen it online, the core bench, it, I would call it a functional, a functional training piece of equipment. You might call it something different. Um, but loosely describe, right? It's a, it's a bench, but there's multiple different components to it. You mentioned before you can do incline, decline. If you think about a regular, a, a bench in a gym, but this is that on steroids and there's a lot of different, I think, core movements that you can do with the bench. So imagine somebody isn't looking at the core bench right now. How would you describe that? What is your, like, if I'm in the elevator with you, I'm an investor, describe to me the core bench just for people listening. Well, and I mean, as far as marketing goes, I was tossed around the idea whether or not I should even say it, but it truly is the most advanced workout bench in the world. And, you know, like I say, I, when I was going through the process, that first patent, I was like, how am I going to like just intensify this thing to where it's untouchable? Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what I did. So, um, it basically, it's a transformer it transforms into 12 different pieces of fitness equipment and you can get a head to toe full body workout. And that's the key is full body piece of equipment. Um, you know, having the core bench, Fully extended, it's seven feet by two feet, so it doesn't take up that much room. That's kind of why I was designing it for physical therapy, mm -hmm. because like I say, it was a small facility, one bench, one bike, one treadmill. To have the core bench in a uh, you know physical therapy setting is awesome because of all the different things it transforms into. But it's the bench, but then there's two separate attachments with a pull pin that slide into the uh, base of it. One being a um, leg extension, leg curl piece, mm -hmm. and the other piece being a 45 degree angle platform that you can lock in and stand on. And that's going to provide, um, you know, hyper extensions for your back, oblique extensions, 
Um, and that's kind of why we came up with the name core bench was because the amount of exercise you can do for your core. But yeah, to have one set of adjustable dumbbells and one bench, it takes up the least amount of space and you can do everything from home. Um, I've actually been training on it now. Um, cause I always like going to the gym to be honest. And I mean, there for a minute after I was going through the patent process, I stepped away. Um, and I had to like, just get out of the house. And once I could, um, to like get out and go do something, but I always revert back to this piece of equipment. Um, I, ha I have one in my, you know, home gym and it's, 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 it's pretty remarkable. And I, I think about just my journey on getting here and having two patents on it. Um, but it's, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's well-deserved and that's not me patting myself on the back. I, I had to think long and hard. How am I going to get into the fitness industry and do something different that nobody else has ever done? Mm -hmm. And I had to do that. And, um, I think we have it to where there's really nothing that can be added or changed, um, from my idea to be stolen by a larger company. But what I like about it is, and so we have a home gym here. I think you saw the one that we had in Austin. We've kind of built that out a little bit. You wouldn't be able to tell by my puny muscles that I work out, but I do. <laughs> but what I, what I do like about it is if you look at companies like Rogue and Rep and Titan and all these, you know, some of these fitness brands, if you go to buy one single piece of equipment, it's expensive, right? Mm. If I'm going to buy... Um, what do I have in the, a, a rep bench, right? Depending upon what type of bench it is, if it can decline or incline, right? You're looking at, I don't know, anywhere between four and eight hundred dollars There's a range here, but that's just for, that's just for a bench. We're not talking about free weights yet. We're not talking about anything else. So then you get into, okay, well, I, and I love, you mentioned it. I love back extension. It just stretches me out and makes me feel really good. You know, I have a, I have a Titan back extension thing that might be like four or $500 as well. Mm -hmm. So the point is you start adding all this stuff up and you're in it. Like, I don't, I don't want to say how loud, how, how much I think the home gym is here. Maybe, maybe eight grand, maybe more between dumbbells, free weights and mm -hmm. all those things. We probably have eight to 10 grand invested in the home gym. Right. So when you think about that and it's, it's a huge footprint. So we have a room taken up with all of this stuff. So, and then the idea of getting all of that in a, you know, essentially in a package where you don't have to take up a whole room with it. You could put it in your garage, right? So I think you're definitely onto something there in regards to, I think, what people want from, it's like, you know, you're going to have you, right? For people who can't see TJ, he's absolutely yoked. He's a big guy, right? So me, I would probably be the audience for this. You wouldn't think that I have that much money in a home gym or that I'm, you know, a, a big fitness guy. So honestly, I think like something like what you've created, it works better for me in regards to my lifestyle. I don't need all that that I have in the workout room. My parents are going to listen to this and they're going to say, oh, we told you we didn't, you didn't need all that. That was excessive, but regardless. So I, I do think you have something really cool. And I love like your entrepreneurial spirit since I've known you and been grinding on this thing. Cause huh. we have been talking about it for, for, I mean, since I've known you and you've probably been working on that for years before you even knew me. So to see this thing through and to see that you took, you know, you just took a trip to Germany, which you can talk about to meet with a manufacturer and others, I guess your persistence in this space is really, really cool. And I commend you for that because a person like me, I'd have just been like, ah, gave it a shot, gave it a try. didn't work out. So kudos to you for that. I, I, well, I thank you for all that brother. Very kind words. Um, Man, like I said, dude, whenever I was a cop, I just want to do my eight to five. I, I would feel bad for these business owners. Like owning a business is no joke. And I mean, you don't have to have, you know, all the paperwork saying you're smart, you know, degrees and all that type of stuff. You have to have some crazy tenacity, some, you know, people throw the word grind or, you know, you have to have the grind and all that, but it's like, more than anything, dude, you have to be a problem solver. And it's like the amount of hurdles, distractions, obstacles that just take you off course. It's unbelievable. And I mean, sometimes I just like, 
my wife and I both will just shake our head like, how in the heck did that just happen? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and it's, it's just like, oh, because, you know, I reach out to God often, every day, every day I do. And I'm always praying, you know, and I'm not praying for like the things I'm praying for, like guidance and direction and wisdom and like protection and, you know, be involved in every single decision that I make with this business. <clears throat> and it's like, you know, even the Bible says you're going to go through struggles and, you know, take pride in it because once you come out the other side, you're going to be able to see the grace of God and like why you went through that in your life. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, and, and I'm only kind of going here because there was something major that happened in Germany while I was there. And I'll, I'll lead into that here in a minute, but, but uh, yeah, dude, to own a business, it's a wild, crazy ride. You know, I mean, very rare. You'll hear the stories about something happening overnight. Very rare. It might be the point zero one percent but yeah, there's definitely dedication involved. And you get to a point, honestly, to where you have so much, heart, soul, tears, money, time, sweat, the rest of it invested into it that you feel like you're at that point to where you'd be absolutely crazy to turn your back on it and try mm -hmm. to like walk the other way. Like I'll take all the bumps, all the bruises and I'll bleed for it. But you know what? Until I hit that point to where I say I've got nothing left, which honestly, I don't see that day happening, but when it does, it's going to take, it's, it's going to take a lot to, to pull me away from it. Just for the, like I say, the amount of time and effort Yeah, I put pencil to paper in 2008. Yeah. That's, that's wild. my first sketch. I'm at the gym. I'm trying to haul butt to get out of there to, uh, you know, go visit my buddy down in San Diego. The gym's packed, all the equipment's taken. And I ended up weaseling my way in and getting like, I think it was the military press bench seat thing. Right. So I was trying to get as much done on that one piece of equipment as I could. So I could. Yeah, it's a 90 degree angle too, right? If we're talking about the same yeah, one, brother. like dumbbell military, just like, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable it. to be honest. You can grab it and do some, you know, tricep. Yeah. You know, kicks on it and things like that. So I just like, did everything I could on this one piece just because I want to get out, hit the road. It was a three or four hour drive from where I was at to San Diego. And while I was in there, I was just sitting there thinking, you know, that'd be cool if, you know, that one piece of equipment that's open could do this, this, and this right now, because I need to do this, this, and this right now. And I was like, why doesn't a company do this? And I mean, if they do that, you know, now it's like one piece of equipment they're selling and they don't get to like break it up into 12 different pieces of equipment. Like, yeah, it's because they, they, they want to make more money off of it, right? They just want to, yeah. And I mean, I've done the research and it's like you were saying, yours might be 8,000. Well, depending on the brand you get, on average, it's everywhere from that $7,000 mark up to potentially oh, yeah. 15,000. You're looking at Rogue or you something, know? you're paying a premium. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, right now the, uh, we have the core bench priced at, um, 1599 on our website. And like I say, for those same 12 pieces, you're paying upwards of anywhere from 7,000, you know, to 15,000. And then at the same time, a lot of us don't have that additional thousand square feet, mm -hmm. you know, 800 square feet of floor space to, to accommodate those pieces of equipment. So that's kind of where I was getting the idea. And I thought about it my whole drive, like I say, four hour drive. And I, you know, I go knock on my buddy's door. He answers. I was like, dude, I need a pen and a paper. Like right now I have this idea, you know? And I mean, we all kind of have different ideas through the course of our life. And we're like, oh, I'm going to get a patent on that. Or I'm going to try to do yeah. some of that. And then, you know, you have a beer and you forget about it. Um, <laughs> but like I went over there and I started sketching it out just put it, it was like on a napkin, put it in my pocket, went and hung out the, the weekend with him. 
and um, ended up driving back into town and taking things a little more serious and like literally getting down and sketching some things out, coming up with some stuff. And then I started doing research on patent attorneys and ended up finding a, a patent attorney in Fresno, California. And, you know, reach out to him, not knowing anything about patents yeah. or what the process was, or what the fees were, but had something and, you know, showed it to him. And he's like, yeah, we can definitely get the process started, you know? And I just kind of like, you know, you give your idea to the patent attorney and then they go do all the research mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, you're not infringing on another invention or, you know, what are the the aspects of the equipment that we can actually go in and you know trademark and you know and, and you know get a patent on and he did all that he, he dissected it for me and then like i say we're going through that first phase four or five years then i submit a whole new thing so it took an additional four or five years pen to paper 2008 finalized patents two of them in 2018 and that's after we had already came to Texas and moved the supplement company here. And I didn't say earlier, but yeah, we ended up doing something with the supplements to like try to hold us mm-hmm. over and actually get our company established while I was waiting for these, uh, the, the, these patents. And they, they were established in 2018. And I, um, from there, I was trying to find manufacturing here in Texas for the core bench. I couldn't find it anywhere because a lot of the steel companies here, they're building buildings, they're mm-hmm. doing bridges, you know, all the major steel. And a lot of companies, you know, Life Fitness, Life Fitness, Cybex, all of them, very, very few, they have to go overseas to get their stuff built. Sure. And, dude, I don't know. I don't know what that process looks like. I didn't know what the patent process looked like. Just going through the motions and trying to, like, find my way. Anyways, I ended up, you know, probably about two years ago, I reached out to a company overseas and sent them my blueprints because, I mean, the patents, of course, are protected here in the United States. But once you go overseas, um, nothing's protected. Okay. And so just roll the dice, hoping they're honest people and desperate to, like, try to find some manufacturing. I uh, sent them everything. And they have been absolutely amazing with the most integrity. I couldn't have been blessed more. And they sent the, they, they followed the blueprints. They sent me a prototype. It was pretty much spot on. There was a couple of tweaks that needed to be made. And, you know, like I say, first contact was two years ago, the process of, you know, then building the first one, I mean, we've had this relationship now and I received my first inventory of official core benches this last February, February, 2024. There you go for you, man. Yeah, man. So we're just getting this off the ground. Um, How cool is that? Tell me, tell me the feeling when you see number one, you get the prototypes and I don't know how it comes to you, right? If it comes on a pallet, comes from overseas, whatever that is, you get that thing. You unwrap it for the first time. It's an idea in a napkin in a pocket years and years ago. How did that feel? Say it had to be like, you know, seeing your baby for the first time. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. You tell me. What was that like? You know, Jordan, I'm going to, it's going to sound crappy to say, but owning a business, I've been beat down so much along the way, dude. Mm Mm-hmm. It's hard to get excited about things. It really, truly is. You know, because like I say, through the course of this, you're anticipating things to go one way and then they go completely another. I will say, you know, it's definitely been gradual because prior to this official version of the core bench being sent to me in February, I've had about probably six different prototypes ahead of that one. Now, the very first one, whenever I was still, you know, having to go through physical therapy and treatment, that one was like a surprise because I finally got to like see my idea come mm-hmm. to some fruition, you know, but whenever 
you have a company, you're always trying to progress. You're always trying to do better, and, you know, and even with like the supplements right now, my biochemists, they're working on those to make them a better version of what they were. So I have it over here in their hands, but that's how the core bench has been through every phase of each prototype. It's gone a little bit better. Absolutely excited to like get the final version, you know, so we can actually start selling and promote because I have all so much marketing material and just really nothing to do with it because we had nothing to sell. It's mm -hmm. just been kind of an idea. Um, but yeah. And I mean, I, I, I don't want to like downplay my excitement. I still see a very long road ahead. I think that's kind of like where I can't feel satisfied in my excitement of this mm -hmm. phase of it because I know what this looks like. And now this was just another chapter of the story receiving the product. Now it's time to like sell that product, you know, and enhance that product and come out with new pieces of, you know, uh, of equipment. Yeah. Um, well, I want to, yeah. I want to, let me do this for you. I want to encourage you because I would say that I'll, and I'm, I'm generalizing here. You know, a lot of people fall off, right? A lot of people have ideas. I've written things on pieces of paper before that I'm like, this is, this is great. <laughs> and I would say I'm the 99% who don't follow through, right? So I would say, you know, the, the encouragement is from this idea that happened so long ago, you are following through and yeah, it's, it's a process, but it's so cool from the outside. Like I'm sure you live it day in and day out and it's a grinder and, and I can imagine that it is. I'll say from my perspective, I think it's amazing that you're building something of it, uh, for your own. I think I will say, I was thinking about this earlier and not to get, not to get too spiritual here, but you know, you mentioned early on in your life, you know, you had three jobs and you needed to do that, to do this. And then you needed to come up with a supplement, right? That it opens up your, your blood vessels to help you. So you've been solving problems your whole life. And I feel like God has put those problems in your way for, for you to solve and build that perseverance for this thing that you're doing. So I, I, I'm sure it's been a journey. I won't pretend to know what it is, but, but I think, I think God has equipped you for this and is continuing to see you through it. And it's so cool from the outside to see somebody that builds something for themselves and not just an idea like, yeah, a podcast, it's fun and interesting, right? It's just like something I'm doing for myself, but something tangible, I, there's something else about that that you can hold, feel, and touch, that, that people can hold, feel, mm -hmm. and use. And that's your idea, man. So I, it's awesome. I'm excited for you. And I, we can continue to talk about it, but I just want to let you know that was kind of on my heart. Is I feel like you've been prepared for this. You've been put through the grinder. I mean, you said earlier, you quoted the Bible earlier, I have a tattoo on my wrist now. It says, rejoice in our suffering. And it's from the Bible. And, and again, Absolutely. it's just, it's not, not great when you're going through it. But I've seen, and I think I believe you've probably seen enough in your life that going through some of this, this suffering or these points in your life, you end up stronger on the end. So I, I can't wait to see the end for you. I mean, you're you're progressing and, pres and progressing. So I just wanted to offer that encouragement because I think it's I think it's awesome. <laughs> nah, brother, I I love you, man, and and I appreciate it. Like seriously, like you you yeah, you, you've always been good to me, man, and and and. I do. I, I need to hear that because it, it kind of puts things into perspective and gives me a little reality check. Like, you know, when when you step in and you're starting a business, right off the, you know, right off the bat, you're thinking, OK, like I think in about two years, I think in about three years, you know, and I mean, you're still kind of stretching it out there. But, you know, as far as me being now in a circle of legitimate business owners, the kind of the the uh, the thing that kind of keeps me like on track, on focus, on mission is a lot of these guys. They say it's taken all of fifteen years before they had their break. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that I holster, man. I do, and it's just like I'm 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 like right there. I mean, you know. Uh, as far as like the time frame goes, but at the same time, I just got the equipment. Um, just you know, and, and 
here, here, here's a little bit of the struggle of like owning a business too. And like I say, curveballs. So my manufacturer, they said, Hey, you know, we want you to come to Germany. We're inviting you, um, basically to come present your core bench and, um, unveil it for the first time in Germany. That way we can start seeking overseas distributors. So I said, I'm on board. I've never been to Germany before. Let's do this on the route. You know, got the core bench totally set up, ready, you know, do all my tools inside it to assemble it. You know, once I was there and, um, you know, all the money to travel to get there, all the preparation, all the this, all the that, the hotel rooms, the rental cars, you know, rented a big O SUV so I could, you know, pick the core bench up because I was having it delivered to my hotel mm-hmm. and I was just going to transport it to the show. Okay. And so this was like a last minute deal. A lot of these companies, like my manufacturer, they've already booked it for next year and we just got back last week. Like these people are planning a year in advance mm-hmm. for this. It's, it's the biggest fitness convention in the world is called FIBO, F-I-B-O. Okay. And, you know, I have my core bench arriving to the hotel about two days before I arrive, just so it's there. Because I know with business, there's going to be curveballs. Well, long story short, my equipment gets held up in customs. <laughs> Shit. And never makes it to the show. No way. The show starts um, April 11th through the 14th, and my equipment arrived in Cologne, Germany on the 6th. So we have basically five days, you know, we'll just call it four days, because usually you want to have everything set up on the 10th if mm-hmm. the show starts on the 11th. It never comes. I've got nothing. I've got my marketing material. I don't have. The core bench there for people to touch, feel like you were just talking about, like being able to get your hands on it and see what it's about. Nothing. You know, I, uh, you know, I had brochures, marketing material, but I'm there with my manufacturers and I had to keep my spirits high. So if I'm not going to promote my core bench, at least I could step in now that I've learned about their equipment and I could like, present their equipment and just do that. Well, that was definitely something negative that happened on the trip. Um, but I did, cause I was able to spend quite a bit of quality time with my manufacturers. They've seen what I did with the core bench. They have a line of, you know, they, they do lines of equipment that are kind of cookie cutter to everything else. Mm-hmm. My equipment was something totally different that they'd never seen before. Well, while I was there, you know, and this is still in the very early stages of uh, something, but it could be a blessing is the fact they want to go in on a 50-50 business relationship with me and they see the way I design equipment and they want to come up with an entirely new product line and like I say, I couldn't ask for um, a better partner in this. Um, it's rare that you have someone approach you to join business whenever they're the ones with a big pocket as mm-hmm. far as you know money goes, as well as a complete full distribution center to take any idea I have and make it come to life. So like I say, early preliminary stages, but you know what, like you're saying, God works in different ways. Could not imagine the core bench was going to get held in customs, bad situation, kept my spirits high and then fell into this conversation that I think ultimately is going to be, has the potential to be uh, much more fruitful than you know, a single piece of equipment because the same single piece of equipment can now be integrated into whatever we're doing over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's interesting about that is I think just listening to it, 
and thinking about how God plays a role and things, right? So that say that core bench shows up, you do your thing. I think maybe this opportunity presented itself for you to be able to show your character to your manufacturer, to whoever this person was, yeah. to show like what happens kind of when you get kicked in the teeth. So for you to, I mean, I would, I don't know how I would take it, probably a lot worse than you. You're a better person than I am. But to uh, be able to kind of just like, you know, pull yourself off and be like, all right, we, we know, I know this sucks, but I'm going to make the best of it. And you, I think you probably, your manufacturer probably saw that. It's like, ah, this is the type of person I want to do business with. So again, something that, you know, still the core bench is still lucrative, but now to have a manufacturer and a partner that can make other things come to life could have opened another door. So absolutely. Yeah. It, it, my sister-in-law said the same thing because my, uh, my manufacturer, they, they brought a lot of their equipment for the show. Like that, that, that was their booth. They just, they invited me just to come set up and kind of like get in front of some uh, European distributors. And I mean, after the Corbett wasn't showing up, I mean, I had full intention on helping them assemble all their equipment any, anyways. Um, but yeah, man, I just, it didn't show up. I jumped right in and just started, you know, grabbing wrenches and doing things and putting equipment together and just, you know, it was, it was kind of like helping me take my mind off my situation. Plus, like I, common practice for me is when things go south and, you know, you just want to grab your pillow and yell into it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> honestly, the thing that will help me get out of that funk 99% uh, of the time is if I do something good for someone else. Yeah, serving others. It's it, it, it's it's crazy, but you know that 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 term. It's better to give than receive. It's real. Mm -hmm. So if I can go do something nice immediately, right then and there, you know, I just had this conversation with my brother yesterday. I just was feeling the heat, you know, bad place, and just simply going to the grocery store and. I'm in a hurry and there's an elderly lady in front of me. She's walking super slow. And I was just like, oh, I gotta get, I gotta go. You know, and I got out to my truck and I was like, what are you doing, man? I ended up going over and helping her with her groceries and taking her car back for and just making sure she got in the car okay. And it's just moments like that to where you can feel better about your situation by helping others. Yeah. I think it's a good life lesson for sure. Sorry about that. No, you're good. But yeah, no, I just, you know, to be able to help out my, uh, my manufacturer and just like step in and like reduce their workload. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe that's what sparked the idea conversation with him. Um, but yeah, I ended up putting, cause I, I've always had this design in my head and I, and I, I think you've seen that picture of my desk, mm -hmm. my office, mm -hmm. like that medieval look. Oh yeah. I love your office um, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I should be. I should be sitting in there, but that's all good. There's construction going on out in the front yard, but yeah, man, it's got that medieval look. Well, that was kind of my idea for this potential venture with uh, with, it, with, it, with it, this new line of equipment. That's awesome. We're have, we'll have three different series. One of the series, you know, it's not going to be all completely medieval times, but it's definitely going to have a rugged appearance, you know, and instead of using like flawless, luxurious, mm -hmm. uh, upholstery, dude, I call it, um, aged battle Brown. And it's going to be, it's going to be like old, just like, you know, warm leather. And it looks really cool. Dude, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And after they presented this idea to me, I ended up going and having dinner that night by myself. After, you know, the convention, Christy, my wife, she didn't go with me to Germany. So, you know, just uh, there was an American steakhouse in Germany right across from the hotel. I said, I'm going there. And I went in and that was the the chairs that they had. And there was like just these old looking weather leather. I mean, they were brand new, but they, they had the appearance. And I was like, that would be sick on mm -hmm. some equipment. So, Dude, what's, uh... don't know where it's going to go. Very no, I early, love that. Well, when, when yeah, I... Uh... When I work out, sometimes I'll listen to uh, to Viking music, like right? the, the the music from the Vikings movie and Ragnar and all those things. I think there's something 
innately barbaric about it when you're when you're victorious yeah when it's, victorious, you're, man. it's like it's like that I, I did one um core bench video just like a clip and i used music that was similar to braveheart yes it's those it just it does something to you you feel and not that this doesn't apply for women as well, but there's something that I, I feel like in the the male genome that's yes. So I love that you're doing that. The theme of that again, I I've, I've had some, I want some Viking things in in the workout room. And again, it just I don't know. Not everything has to be polished and pretty. Imagine what people used to live back in the day, whether it was a rock or a, a large trunk of a tree, whatever it was, just to just to prove their strength. So I love that idea I, from a, from a marketing perspective. I'm like drooling over here. I'm like, Oh, that sounds great. Cause there's nothing, I haven't yeah. seen anything like it. Everything is like polished iron or steel and, and black. And you know, you can customize your color, but it's like, okay, that's, that's all right. But everybody's doing that. Exactly. That That's my thing. And that's that. Cause I, like I say, I put together like a 13 page presentation to my manufacturers. Like, here's my idea. Um, and like I said, there's three different series. But it's like to get onto the internet these days, GoDaddy to like try to find a domain that's not taken. Oh yeah, good luck. Right. When I score, they're out, they're out there buying them up, man. Just people buy oh, them and try are. and resell them. Yeah, and like everything I looked at, you know, it said it was taken. Then I would actually go see. And some of them were being used, but some of them there was no website attached. They just want you to like, you know pay them for the the domain yeah the ridiculously a thousand dollar a year fee just because they grabbed it first and they're sitting on it yeah bro so you know um maxim magazine oh yeah m-a-x-i-m uh-huh so i was out i was able to get maxim armor i like it yeah which you got the domain to what we're talking about here yeah you know even like Maximilian or whatever his freaking name was on the movie 300. Well, there was Maximus. Yeah. And it wasn't, uh, um, was it Maximus or that was Marcus Aurelius. The, uh, one of the, I'm thinking of the gladiator movie, but still yes. Yeah. yeah. Maxim, Maxis, Mad yeah, Max. I, 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 all the, I was all. able to get, yeah, I was able to get Maxim armor, which I thought that worked out decent. And then I got, um, and these will all be integrated into one domain. Mm-hmm. But because I told you they're going to be three different series. One's going to be a Pilates series. Um, so we can hit that uh, outreach. And But the, the uh, Pilates series and the other series, which is called Maximum Flex okay. series. Um, oh, I like that. Like Maximum yeah, Flex, but Maximum Flex? Maximum Flex. And then the word uh, flexion, F-L-E-X-I-O-N, mm-hmm. that's a commonly used word in the Pilates industry. Um, it's, it's, it's all about exercises, about opening up your spine. Um, so it's called, there's, there's Maxim Flex and Maxim Flexion. Mm. So I was able to get those, but those are going to mirror one another. And it's almost like if you walked into a, uh, an, a uh, Apple store. Oh, yeah. Everything's just white and mm-hmm. clean and, you know, wood and brown. And, you know, I love wood. Yeah, so it's the, the neutral. That's, yeah. So for series, you know, the, the flex series and flexion series, it's going to be Pilates and fitness equipment, but it's going to be um, more elegant instead of, you know, so kind of hardcore with the armor. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that I mean, instantly I, I, I just – Whenever I hear something that's inspiring, I'm on it. I, I don't waste any time. And I mean, that. It, it, that's how my crew is in the manufacturing too. So, you know, to, tr- to try to like show them that I'm not along for a free ride and I actually have something here, I, I just wanted to present my idea. So it, early yeah. stages, I probably shouldn't have been talking about it, but. It's okay. Um, I Let's yeah. make sure that you, um, and I'll say this to you now, and I will not post this until <laughs> Make sure you go get all the handles for those on social media and the and the websites, because you know some dog out there is gonna just try and go jump on those if they listen to it, right? So, so just letting you, so just letting you know, I will not post this until you go grab those off of Instagram, 
Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever you want. Or I'll just cut this sure. part out, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, I'm yeah, just talking uh, to you as a friend now because this I would have forgotten to do this later, and I'm like, ah, th- now's not the time to do it because this is on the podcast. But I'm just going to tell you now, and I'll yeah, just post no, this later. Um, I know I, I didn't even think about that. I had the domain so I was fired up. Um, yeah, dude, just if you can find a way just to cut out all that, I don't even need to be talking about that. We're just we're buddies. And I'm just like filling yeah, in no, on it's all journey. good. I I will I will cut it. For sure. Yeah. Because I, well, I don't want to happen to somebody just to go sna- snag it just to try and hold one over on you. It's all good. Totally. Dude, I um, I, I maybe have five left, and I'll cut that part too. Cohen just came down here. I got to take him to soccer. But I wanted, yeah. I wanted to, um, maybe we'll re-enter back in here. So with McCall Fitness and, and what you're doing, you know, with the, the core bench, the supplements, you know, let's use this spot for a bit of a, a bit of a plug. What, where, do, where do people need to go to check it out? How can they support you right now? Kind of in, in the, in the stages that you're walking through. I think anything that comes to mind would be just be happy to give you a second there to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, website, McCall fitness.com M C C A L L. Um, but yeah, like we we're just getting started. You know, it's been a long journey to get here. Like I say, since 2008 to get here, but we actually have a product that we're moving. And, um, you know, besides just residential, we're also getting it into physical therapy facilities, kind of mm-hmm. like where I originally got the idea. Um, but yeah, I think we're very fair price. I mean, right now with the way inflation is and the market is, it's tough for people to reach in their pocket. Um, and I get that. Um, so that's why I really wanted to bring the price down. Like I had, you know, cause I was contacting different, uh, physical therapy equipment distributors mm-hmm. and they were asking my price point, you know, and what retail is. And I, I was telling them retail and they were like, you can probably, you're probably leaving some money on the table. Like you probably get more for, you know, for it. Uh, I, and I mean, I'm not trying to do that. I, I want these things to move, man. And I, I, I want to have them at a fair price because I'll tell you, even when I'm going to buy whatever, if, if, if I feel like the price is at a point that's more than what it needs to be, I, w- I won't get it, even, even if I feel like I need it. So mm-hmm. I, I, I want to because, I mean, this the, the core bench, it's not just for someone brand new trying to create a home gym. It's for existing home gyms. I mean. People might have a flat bench that doesn't do anything. They might have a bench that goes from flat to incline. Like if you want to take your home gym space and take it to another level, this is like the core bench is that perfect addition. So Mm -hmm. I just, I I want to keep it at a price point that's reasonable. And while at the same time, helping people see the fact that, you know, like I say, anywhere from 7,000 up to 14,000 for the same pieces of equipment that take up your whole house. Sure. Like we, we, we found a way to do this and do it well and keep it at a price. Um, it's very favorable. And, um, you know, I think there's some, I think the pricing is smart. Not that my opinion matters, but you know, you overprice something and then, okay. Then the, the marketing tactic there would be to constantly be running a sale. So you show something on your website that has says $3,000, but it's marked down 10%. Well, it's always marked down 10%. There's always a sale because you're overpriced. So to come out in the market overpriced, this is my opinion on things. You either have to be constantly running a sale because you're not getting sales, right? Nobody's buying your thing. So you have to reduce price. And then how does that make it look versus coming out with a fair price to begin with? You know, know, in in the hindsight of that, you kick yourself in the ass later on because you just can't make them fast enough. But at the same time, I'd rather push more volume at a fair price than have something where I have to be you know, they have something that I have to back off on or constantly be running a sale on because then I feel like that devalues things. It makes them not feel in a consumer's mind when they see that. It's like, well, why is it on sale or why is it always marked down? So I, I think the approach is, uh, of course, your character, but it's fair. And I think it's probably the smart one. Again, you've been waiting for this thing to come out. You want validation in the marketplace. Again, money's tight. I'm sure manufacturing costs and costs of of materials is probably significant as well. If you're thinking about the different materials such as steel or, you know, I'm not sure if it's made of steel or, 
for oh, yeah. aluminum, right? But steel is expensive. So I think the price is considerably fair. So not that my validation yeah. matters, but I think that that approach makes a lot of sense. Well, no, man, and you're, you're super smart at all this. You, you really are just from, from our past conversations. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, man. You know, um, I thought I'd be cute for a while. I'm like, run it. and it's just market research, man, brand new mm -hmm. product. You got to fill the market. So it's just, you know, you, you, you price it up here and you put a red line through it and this is the new price. And just like what you just said, it's just like, I didn't want to be that company that's constantly trying to like run a sale because yeah. you're overpriced, like just keep it real, keep it transparent. And that was the thing about it too, is like the engineering that went into this core bench is unreal. It truly is. I mean, for instance, there's a major distributor. They're called Johnson fitness. They're here in the United States. They're a global company. And I had, cause I did take the core bench, um, just after receiving it to LA, mm -hmm. um, Ursa, Ursa is a fitness convention and it was held, um, in LA this last year. And I did, I took the core bench and I had a representative from Johnson fitness come through and he's like, I come to these things year after year for the last 10 years. And he said, I finally got to see something different, which yeah. That, 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 that was, that was a huge pat on the back for me because, you know, for someone that's so educated in the market and in, in, in the uh, industry to come by and spend time with the equipment, I got a three minute marketing video. Um, it's on our website, uh, basically showing how this whole thing functions. He watched the entire video and, and that was his takeaway. He's like been here, coming here and I've never seen something that like, I could honestly say is different. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we took, like I was getting back to the engineering side of it, you know, this thing is, is um, durable enough to go into a commercial gym all day long and get beat up on by 50 to a hundred people a day. It has that strength, but at the same time, we use pieces that are steel and we also use pieces that are aluminum that are as strong as steel, but lighter in weight. Mm -hmm. And so, the attachment pieces that slide in the hyperextension piece um, and the leg, attach leg attachment piece, some of the parts on that, the components are made out of aluminum, just so you're not picking up a 50, 60 pound, yeah. you know, attachment to try to like assemble the bench. These things are like about 30 pounds. And honestly, they're super lightweight and easy to maneuver. So, um, the engineering that has gone into the core bench is just above and beyond. I'm so proud of like everybody that's been a part of it. Cause you know, I've never been a welder. I don't know this. I had was an idea and I took it and then worked side by side to like really customize in a way that, um, we weren't going to have to go back and do a lot of extra steps. Sure. Um, one of this thing, perfect. I'm completely OCD all the time about everything. I want this thing perfect before we even put it into the hands of the very first customer. Yeah. Well, man, I'm, I'm super excited for you. Um, obviously watching it progress, ha having seen it progress, seeing how it's progressed even further from the, you know, the, the supplements to the core bench, you know, while, while we're waiting for the core bench to now and I'm getting to see the, the core bench. So I, I can't wait to continue to watch you in your journey in that. I'd love to have you back on at some point to even further talk about that. So McCallFitness.com to check it out. Then when will, when will units be, are units already available? Right. I think, I think you yep. mentioned, yes, we're live. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Yep. Ready to rock and roll. And, um, yeah, we, yeah. Cause, cause not to like, you know, because I know we're getting ready to shut down, but in Germany, the distributors over there, mm -hmm. I was able to even just provide them my marketing material. And with them being in the industry and seeing something that was so different, yeah, I've been contacted. I was answering emails and drawing up contracts this morning for um, a distributor in Saudi Arabia. No way. <laughs>
I never thought I'd be <laughs> doing anything like this. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's just now this is the next chapter of the book, I have the equipment. And I've been in contact with several European distributors too, because I was really bummed out that the core bench didn't make it. But at the same time, through my marketing material, the website, things like that, they've gone in and they've seen enough to uh, interest them. Well, that's incredible. Next time I'm uh, next time I'm in Austin, I'm gonna come over. We'll uh, we'll maybe have some 10 a.m. bourbon and check out the core bench. <laughs> yeah, brother. This time you could pass out on the uh, core bench. Yeah, there you go. That that uh, works. You throw me in the garage, but dude, I mean, thank you for taking the time. Number one, of love here, and 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 I know some of this, but I love for others to hear kind of the story, you know, from. The, the grinding early days in three jobs to your time serving to your resilience working through, you know, kind of your comeback with, you know, your health and that and that through that accident to the entrepreneurial journey that you've been on for a long time. Because I think oftentimes we see it in the media that you know, we have these ideas that, oh, you just come up with something and then tomorrow it's built and made. And, you know, th those are the 1% stories that you hear but you don't hear about the grinders who eventually, who eventually, you know, have that breakthrough moment too. So it's very sobering to hear you talk about it. And I think it's encouraging too, for other people out there who might be feeling or going through something similar, that it's okay. It's almost affirmation that this is part of the process. And so I, I, again, I find that encouraging. I, I'm not, not doing the same thing as you, but as I think about the daily things that I want for myself and whatever. And yeah, it's just a journey it's, at the end of the day, it's a journey and it's about building relationships. And you know, I'm thankful to have met you. We have a dining room table in our home that is made by you and it is, it's featured in our dining room and I see it all the time. And I think about you. So, uh, you're a part of our life, whether you want to be or not. Um, mm. but again, uh, you know, thank you so much. Yeah, man. No, I was, I was happy to, uh, build that for you. And I mean, that thing's a monster, so you can't just hide it anywhere. Yeah, I had you, Chris Mori down the street. He was he came here a couple of years ago on my birthday or something. He had to help me move that. We had to get moving straps to move it. And I tell you, I felt like I was gonna buckle, man. I like I was not ready for it. It is a beast for sure. But it made the trick. It is. It is. Yeah, man. I'm so I'm so happy that uh, we got to do this today. And yeah, I, I, I value our friendship. I love you, brother. And, I always appreciate any time I get to spend with you. I love you too, man. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. All right, TJ. I'll talk to you later. Take it easy, brother. Bye. Bye. I'll cut it there. Dude, thanks so much. Yeah, man. Honestly, it sucks, dude. I've been going through this whole whole thing. I can't even see your face. Oh, it's I can see yours. You you're coming through great. <laughs> uh, yeah, dude, I don't know what happened, man. Uh, I'm sure that was annoying, but thanks for grinding through it. Cause again, on this end, everything, uh, everything looked good. So yeah, dude. Well, cool, man. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah. If you want to cut out all that mess about this potential business that I'm starting with my manufacturers, I found you know? it, I found it interesting, but I want to cut it to protect you because I want to give you time to like grab some of those social things or whatnot. Yeah. I no, again, I, I, I think, I thank you for reminding me too. I act like there's, you know, a hundred thousand people that are going to watch or listen to this. And in reality, there aren't, but just to protect yourself, I'll cut that part out. Yeah, man. All yeah. Right, and I, I'll definitely get on there and try to start scooping those up. Yeah. Just, uh, I would sooner than later. I mean, that's exactly what I did for the podcast here. It's like, once I came up with a name, that's the first thing that I did is make sure that those were available and just snatch them off the ground. Yeah. Huh. Just I use know. your, um, I don't know, use your McCall Gmail address or if you have one for, I don't know. You could even create a dummy Gmail address, right? Just uh, go create a new Gmail. Use that Gmail to register for all these names and then just sit them on the side for now. Like you won't have to mess with them, but just sit them, sit them to the side so you got them. Yeah. Yeah, I completely forgot about that, dude. That was a good plug, so... I got you, dude. I'll, so, I'll good jump on there and do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I got. I, I I need to do that, man. I know. I'm just so freaking busy, dude. It's like, okay, another thing, but I need to. Yeah, it's all good. Yes. I'll, I'll cut it so you won't have to worry about it. Just do it on cool, your own man. time.
All right, brother. All right, man. I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me two hours of your life. I wish I could have seen more of you. It's all good. I, I plan on coming there at some point this year. Um, when I do, I'll, I'll look you up. Come on, please. Will do. Hey, if you're ever in Kentucky, I know you had friends that moved from here back to there, but if you're ever here, you're more welcome to stay with us. Look us up, please. Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm seriously, I'm going to be doing some traveling. So if we're in your neck of the woods doing some type of fitness convention stuff or something, yeah, you know, definitely, bro. I will definitely contact you if I'm in that area. Okay. I'm holding you to it. Come on. All right, man. Have a good rest of the day. You too, brother. Thank you. All right. See ya. Bye.